Greetings to the global clinical engineering community. I'm Nicole Cohara, Corporate Communications Director for PartSource, the world's largest evidence-based marketplace for medical equipment, products, and services. I am thrilled to welcome you to a special panel with some amazing leaders I have the pleasure of working with. This Way Up, inspirational stories from women who excel in the clinical engineering profession is the name of our panel today. Our objectives are to elevate and celebrate women clinical engineering leaders among the global clinical engineering community, to inspire the next generation of women clinical engineering leaders to excel in the profession, and to provide helpful insights regarding multiple clinical engineering career pathways from real, real examples from our panel. On the panel, we have a diverse group of women leaders who all took different paths to success in their current roles, overcame challenges and obstacles with the help of others, and have words of wisdom to share with you from their experience to inspire your journey. Now, I will invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves and their current role as context for our conversation. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer DeFrancesco, and I'm a healthcare technology manager and healthcare operations executive. Hi, I am Carol Davis Smith. Uh, my background is clinical engineering, and I currently um, am the principal in my own clinical engineering consulting firm and based in Phoenix, Arizona. Hello, everyone. I'm Mara Pere. I'm currently vice president of client solutions for PartSource, where I implement procurement solutions for healthcare organizations across the United States. Good day, everyone. My name is Dikeledi Mudipa. I am a clinical engineer currently in the role of senior procurement specialist in South Africa. Thank you so much for the introductions. Why don't we start the first question from the beginning and talk about career paths. Mara, can you tell us how you discovered the clinical engineering career path and began your journey in the field? Sure, I'd be happy to. You know, I've taken a really untraditional path into clinical engineering. Um, in college, I, like many young people, wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do and had never heard of clinical engineering. And I actually graduated with a degree in global studies, so had absolutely nothing to do with the clinical engineering industry. Um, out of school, I went into the real estate field and uh, did that for several years and took some time off to do some volunteering overseas for a couple of years. And when I came back, I had a real opportunity to stop and evaluate what I wanted to do career-wise. I knew it wasn't real estate, but I wasn't sure what it was. And through some happy circumstance and some personal connections, I interviewed for a job in program management or project management with an independent service organization that specialized in clinical engineering. And um, once I got that job, I really <laughs> fell in love with the industry, and that was that was how I entered that path. Um, you know, I've always loved working on things where they have a beginning and an end, which is what really spoke to me about project management. And there's there's so much of project management within clinical engineering, so it ended up being something that I really really loved. And you know, I took that job as a project coordinator and um, haven't looked back since. So I've been in several different roles throughout my, my tenure in this industry and uh, everything from project coordination to um, operations for clinical engineering for a hospital um, nonprofit organization and now working at PartSource. So I think I'm, I'm just proof that you don't necessarily have to have a technical background to be in clinical engineering. Um, and find it to be an industry that, you know, you really love. That's great. You definitely had a uh, unique entry point, and um, I know there's so many different paths to enter the, the profession. Why don't we go to Jenna? Jenna, can you tell us how you became involved in the global clinical engineering community? Yeah, so, you know, similar to Mara, um, I had a, a, I always say happenstance, but I like the way she said it, you know, happy circumstances. Uh, I am a biomedical engineer by trade. I have my bachelor's and master's in biomedical engineering. And I was working in a research lab uh, with some stem cell research. And I happened to run into some biomed techs one day and they said, hey, you know, what are you doing after graduation? You should come work here. And I'm like, I didn't even know biomedical engineers worked in a hospital. 
And so I, uh, they said, yeah, just pop in, you know, talk to our director. Uh, and so I popped in and the director there spent some time with me and, and really explained the field to me. And from there, you know, just researching it and getting involved. So our field is just so friendly that it's so easy to open those others, but a lot of folks just don't know what clinical engineering or healthcare, healthcare technology management are. And then on the global level, you know, I was at Amy Exchange in 2018, and I realized that Adriana Velasquez, the WHO coordinator for medical devices, was there. And so I just happened, I was actually going to a different um, program, and then I saw her and I said, oh my god, I have to go in there. And so I was sitting there in the front row and I happened to text one of the gentlemen in the room who was retired, I thought, <laughs> out of clinical engineering. And I said, oh my God, I'm fangirling out. I'm so excited you know, to be sitting here and, and to be listening to this presentation. Little did I know he was actually in his retirement, the chair of the IFMBE CED board. And he said, let's talk about this. Um, so with that, I've had a lot of opportunities becoming part of the IFMBE CED group and really on a global level, getting to integrate with our counterparts. And I think it's just so amazing, especially with the COVID-19 pandemic, to be able to share those stories and those experiences so that, you know, we can really build this global ethos that is clinical engineering. Absolutely. That's fantastic. Those connections really... Um, are important piece of that career pathing and, and getting to uh, the next level and where you're meant to be. Uh, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the challenges that, that we face? Uh, we all know women face unique challenges across disciplines in healthcare and across all professions. One of our objectives today is to inspire the women watching to overcome these challenges. So let's start with uh, Dika Lady. Can you explain your experience with the challenges of being a woman in the HTM profession and how you've overcome them? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nicole. I think early on in my career, because I was the smallest and the shortest usually within the group of people that I worked with, it became very difficult coming into a male-dominated industry because I was in a hospital setting. So what you would find is that the work allocated to me wasn't necessarily the work which I was skilled for or I was overskilled for, so I was allocated administrative work because I was a woman and because I was small. And the gentlemen there believed that, or part of an error that believed that women necessarily in, aren't meant to be in the, in the technical field. So in trying to, to change that of them, I made sure that they actually saw me uh, doing the actual physical work. And this is where they were able to actually change their minds and to have conversations behind that just because i'm a woman and just because i'm, I'm smaller in appearance doesn't mean that uh, strenuous work i wouldn't be able to do it and uh, this is something which is close to my heart because i feel that especially women um, might be a bit limited and actually believe that they won't go anywhere within the industry because because of this. And I found allies in some of my previous technical managers or, or, or leaders. Um, and I actually called them to them and say that we need to change this within the company or within the actual industry so that more and more young women can actually join in. Well, wow, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. Also, thank you. you've overcome a lot and you've helped pave the way for, for the next generation of women. So congratulations on that. So important to know that, you know, we can succeed and that message um, of overcoming challenges is, is really important as well. And you're definitely a, a personal inspiration. So let's talk a little bit about leadership. Clearly, finding leadership opportunities to demonstrate value is really critical to a successful career. 
And uh, Carol, I'd love for you to share with us how you've identified leadership opportunities in your career. Sure, Nicole, thank you. Um, I was really fortunate to receive two incredibly um, valuable pieces of advice uh, right out of the gate when I was a, um, an intern as a clinical engineer. And, and probably, honestly, it's probably advice that I received much earlier as a, as a, a young person growing up. Um, but, but they were first, introduce yourself. Whenever there's a new person around, you introduce yourself. And the second piece of advice was ask questions. Um, and I think we hear that one a lot in terms of ask questions, ask how this works, ask how that works. But I think it's incredibly important to ask questions when you meet new people. Um, this allowed me opportunities to lead, um, at, quite honestly, even as an intern, uh, but certainly as a staff engineer, because I would meet people like the construction manager. Um, I would meet people like the, someone from the finance department or from the supply chain department, and certainly nurses um, in every unit, physicians across units. And when I met them, I asked them, well, what do you do? What is your role? How did you get here? I'd ask basically for their story, right? Which would help me understand um, not so much what they could do for me, although that was incredibly important, um, but it helped me understand how I, as a clinical engineer, could impact the work they do. Um, and so I, um, over the years, I've often said codependency is a good thing um, because if I could understand what they needed, I could then behave in a way and develop skills and whatnot that would create a dependency. They needed me um, in the workplace, in their clinical environment to solve the problems and deliver the care that they uh, wanted to, to deliver. And so, as I said earlier in my career, this led to things like the opportunity to lead projects, um, to interact at a, even just as a staff person, not as a management person, um, at levels that were pretty um, unusual, at least for the date, and certainly unusual even today for that level of position. Um, but as far as career opportunities, um, it played out in spades. And, and really not even, that wasn't my intention. It, it was a beautiful, um, outcome, unexpected outcome. So for instance, two examples, as I was um, working in, uh, in a position uh, mid-career, um, I was living in North Carolina doing technology assessment. Um, I had spent a, an enormous amount of time getting to know my supply chain colleagues. Um, I worked for a large uh, group purchasing organization at the time. So I met people from the business side of healthcare, from the supply chain, lots of clinicians that um, were in the hospitals and health systems that belonged to the GPO and whatnot, had interacted with them a lot, solved problems both officially and unofficially for them and whatnot, and really had relationships, which is what this comes to. I built relationships with these people. So one day I actually got a phone call and they said, Carol, there's this great opportunity with one of our large members out in Phoenix, and we'd like you to talk to them and potentially take this, this role. Um, long story short, I took the role um, it moved me from North Carolina to Arizona, which was great because it worked, it was twofold. One, it was an awesome opportunity, and two, it brought me back home closer to my family. So uh, that, that was an opportunity that had I not had those relationships would never have happened. Fast forwarding again, while I worked that job and it evolved into another thing and another thing, again, because of the relationships I had inside um, that company, that I, the, the GPO that I worked for, um, Again, one day I got a phone call, um, which led to the position at Kaiser Permanente, where I assumed uh, my first executive level role, vice president of clinical technology uh, for that health system. And it came because in the, over the years, I had not only um, introduced myself and asked questions of people I worked with, but much like Jenna said, I reached out to professional colleagues in association. So I had invested a significant amount of time in uh, as a volunteer leader with the Amy organization and contacts through that had referred me to the recruiter, which then led to the Kaiser Permanente job. So if I wrap this all up, I would say two pieces of advice is just like your mom probably taught you um, or your dad taught you, introduce yourself when there's someone in the room right? Um, and then 
put yourself sort of to the side and ask them to tell you about their story and their journey and what they're doing and educate yourself that way. That's great advice, Carol. Thank you so much for sharing your personal story. I think it's inspiring to know that just asking the right questions and, you know, not being quiet and uh, speaking up and having a voice and, and meeting people really can open a lot of doors. So let's shift gears and talk about uh, the role of others in your success. Uh, Carol, let's stay with you uh, for a minute. Um, mentors, you certainly had some great relationships based on uh, the last question. Can you tell us how mentorship from other women helps play, to play a role in excelling your career? Sure. Um, so, so mine is an interesting story. Um, I, I'm not sure that, of the accuracy of this, but as I look at the field, I'm sort of second generation, right? So um, founding fathers uh, of our field were actually my mentors. There were not, at least w in the places I worked and, and, and delivered clinical engineering services, there were not uh, a lot, if any, other women uh, in the field, in the department. Um, and, and that was just a function of place and timing. Um, I had amazing male mentors. I would not be here without them. However, I had incredible women mentors because I introduced myself to nursing staff and to physician staff and to other areas of the hospital where there were more women working in the field. Um, and so that really played out as a benefit one, uh, just having someone else that looked a little bit like me in the workplace, even if their job was different, was helpful. Um, but it also was extraordinarily helpful because again, like my previous comments, having mentors from other parts of the industry opened up my vision um, dramatically. So it wasn't just about the technology. It wasn't just about maintenance. It was about so many more worlds that are operating in, in collaboration and in coordination uh, across healthcare. Yeah, it's interesting uh, to think about, you know, the, the time period and how your different experiences based on when you came up in the industry were different. I know uh, Mara in our previous conversations, um, unlike Carol, you did have a female mentor within uh, the same profession. Um, can you tell us a little bit about her and how she helped you find success? Sure, I'd be happy to share that. Yeah, I've been very lucky in that I've had a couple of um, even direct managers that have been women um, over the years in my different roles within clinical engineering. And I've taken something different away from, from all of those relationships. And I would echo what Carol said, which is building relationships is the best way to learn and to advance. And I've found that even in my career, advancement path that the best opportunities have arisen as a result of direct personal relationships that I've cultivated over time. Um, and it's also a great way to get to know an organization and know if, if you want to have a role there or not, um, is to get to know the people that work there. So, um, you know, I'll just speak briefly about two individuals that I've had the pleasure of working with and, and being mentored by in the past. Um, when I was hired into my first role at the at the ISO organization that I worked at, um, I was hired by um, a woman who had a clinical engineering degree and was was leading a department there. And um, for me, that was that was amazing to see um, see her in that role. And I learned I learned that, you know, one that it was okay to speak up in, in what was very often a male dominated um, room <laughs> and that it was important to speak up and, and to share my viewpoint. Um, and she had absolutely no hesitation in doing that. And I, I took her lead because my personality was a bit more reserved than hers was, but I saw that she could do it. So of course I knew that I could do it as well. Um, I would say she also really challenged me to take on opportunities that were outside of my comfort zone. And because I could sit down and talk with her about those opportunities and tell her, I felt comfortable sharing with her what my concerns were and together we could work through a path, you know? And as a result of that, you know, when I moved to, I actually moved to the, um, 
the healthcare organization that I worked for, um, I followed her and I, I moved after she moved there as a result of the relationship we had built and how much I enjoyed working with her. Um, and she gave me an opportunity there to directly manage um, clinical engineering technicians, which I had not done in my, my career. And because I didn't have the technical background, I had a lot of questions about whether that was something I would be competent at or not. And she really helped guide me through that process and gave me the confidence that that was something I could learn um, and that it was not outside of the, the scope of, of what my abilities were. Um, so I really, really appreciated that about her. Um, you know, everything from learning how to create budgets, you know, every time something new would come up, she would say, Mara, you got this, you can do this. <laughs> and just that, that vote of confidence from her um, really helped me, helped me cement my, my love of the industry and my ability to always take on a new challenge and, and learn from it and grow from it. So, and secondarily, I, I had a leader also um, who came from the supply chain world and uh, there was a different set of skills and things that I learned from her. She was very analytically minded and data driven. And um, once I had interacted with her and really kind of learned how, how that can play a role in one, you know, getting the resources that I needed to, to execute on my work and make sure that our customers were being taken care of and patient care was being impacted positively. Um, I really, you know, kind of understood then the power of data and analytics and the storytelling that goes around that in order to drive change. And I think taking that away from my interaction with her has really aided me through my whole career in understanding the importance of, of telling that story through, um, through data and through analytics. So, you know, I think it's just about recognizing that any relationship that you build, um, one, you have to be proactive about it, and two, you just have to um, have those conversations and be willing to be open with people about what your fears and challenges are and ask for their, their feedback about how to overcome that, because typically when you do that, you come out of, the, come out of it on the other side with some great results. Very inspirational story and also great advice for the next generation. Let's build on that concept and um, have the last set of questions really be around some key takeaways for our audience. Um, how about, um, how about we, we go to you for some advice for the next generation of global engineering leaders? Absolutely. So I think one of the best experiences I had in this field is I started in this field as an intern. So even though I had my master's, I had two years where I really worked intensively with folks and I had that intern, um, you know, kind of name. And so as an intern, you got to ask a lot of questions. You got to get your hands dirty and everything. I think people, um, I don't want to say they took for granted, but you were really had open doors to a wide range of knowledge and information. You also got the projects that people probably didn't want to do or they thought that's going to be really hard. Let's give it to the intern and see what they can do with it. Um, so I always tell people, I'm like, number one, keep your intern mentality. So no matter what title comes before your name or what letters come after it, you know, having that mentality of, I can do anything. I'm willing to do the projects that no one else likes or that no one may know, but have a really big impact. And really just thinking about that, that process of being a continuous learner and a continuous student, health technology is really advancing at a rapid rate. And so it's not something you ever come to an end on. It's something you always have to keep up to date with. And even with that, uh, even if technology doesn't change, the healthcare environment is changing, and you really have to be a lifelong learner and someone willing to roll up your sleeve and really do that work. Um, I think both Mara and Carol touched on this as well, but learning from others. So that's not necessarily just other clinical engineers or healthcare technologists or BMETs. That's really learning from everyone. I've had a wide range of mentors, including nurse executives and pharmacy folks, you know, those other people that really round out your perspective of the healthcare environment and the role you play in that. Um, always sit at the table and raise your hand for stretch assignments. So again, this is the other piece of being willing to do hard things. You know, talking with your supervisor, talking with others within your organization and saying, 
hey, I'm really interested in this because when those opportunities come up, they're able to say, I know that they're looking for some stretch assignments here. I'm going to assign those. Um, and also networking. So we have such a rich and diverse community for clinical engineering globally. Um, networking with others and learning those lessons from them. I am sometimes guilty of. Um, but lastly, I think my biggest piece of advice is just to remember why you do what you do. Um, so within clinical engineering at a hospital, I always say there's people here having the worst days of their lives, you know, but there's also people here having the best days of their lives. And I think it's one of those things that it's such an honor to be part of that and that people trust you, whether they know it or not, when they're coming, when they're coming to your hospital, you know, they're trusting you with some of the most sensitive, you know, happy and sad times of their lives. And it's such an honor to be part of that. So I think whenever things get hard, you know, keeping that as your true north and checking back to that is really something that has um, kept me very steady, even during some difficult times in this field. What a very inspiring answer and uh, great advice for all of our listeners, um, men and women, um, really uh, thinking about the importance of speaking up and taking on those stretch assignments and, and really believing in yourself and, and being uh, focused on the mission. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. I want to thank everyone uh, for sharing your insights and experience today. Uh, we would love to expand this conversation um, and uh, continue by inviting you to join us in this dialogue. So if you are looking to expand your professional network and be part of the conversation about women in clinical engineering, or if you're seeking connections for mentorship, please join our LinkedIn group, Women in Clinical Engineering, and post a comment about your experience and let us know the topics you'd like to discuss and that you'd like to see as this conversation about women in clinical engineering evolves globally. Thanks for watching and everyone stay safe and healthy. Thank you.